Great day, companions. How are you? Today we will discuss Alfa Romeo Alfa Sud. Alfa Romeo was one of the manufacturers which wanted to capitalize on the ballooning demand for lower priced cars in the late 1960s as more people became well off enough to afford to start driving. The company may have enjoyed past successes in racing and in the 1960s boasted a range of beautiful sporting coupes and saloons, but in order to survive and prosper into the 1970s, expansion was the key, and that meant it needed a small car in the range. The Italian company had previously dabbled with small car projects. Back in 1952, it created a prototype 750cc car known as Project 1361. The twin-cylinder transverse-engined Mini competitor would have hit the market spot-on in time for the 1956 fuel crisis. Sadly, the company wasn't blessed with clairvoyance for strategists, and the plug was pulled on the grounds of costs, leaving the booming Italian small car market completely to fiat. Eight years later, the idea of a small Alpha was revisited with the Tipo 103 prototype. The scaled-down Julia Saloon featured an advanced 1.0-litre DOHC power unit and 85 mm top speed. But again, the promising project was abandoned on the back of Alfa Romeo and Renault's short-lived cooperative deal, which involved selling R4s and Dauphine in Italy. Alfa Romeo didn't abandon the idea of a small car, though, and as the need for one increased, so did the desire to develop something new and a bit special. In 1967, Alfa Romeo's chief executive, Giuseppe Luraghi, once again revisited the idea of the company building a new small car. Little did he know of the political storm he was about to create. Because Alfa Romeo needed financial assistance with the new car's creation, Luraghi approached the Italian government for help. However, in the interests of developing the poorer southern region of the country, there was a stipulation attached to the loan. The new car needed to be built in the deprived Naples region, 300 miles from the company's base in Milan. Alfa Romeo agreed to build the new car at its little-used Avio facility in Pomigliano d'Arco, near Naples, and the entire project became known as Alfa Sud. The government loan ran to 360 billion lira, but needless to say, it wasn't a happy situation as the area had no tradition of car manufacturing and that led to 15,000 unskilled workers being taken on to build the new car. That aside, Fiat management was furious when details of the Alpha Sud project become common knowledge. The bad blood between the two companies started because Alpha's Torinese saw it as a break in the gentleman's agreement, despite Fiat's earlier introduction of the Alpha Rivaling 130 and Dino models. Accusations of poaching, theft and treason were trumped up by the Torinese company, seriously delaying the Sud's eventual release. The conflict was deepened when Alfa managed to persuade the Austrian Fiat engineer Rudolf Ruska, along with several colleagues, to oversee the design of the new car, especially as Fiat was in the throes of developing its next generation of small front-driven family cars. The hiring of Ruska, no matter how controversial, was a stroke of genius. His masterminding of the Alfa Romeo Alfa Sud and tight control of its remarkable technical package was a perfect example of the theory that history's greatest cars were created by talented individuals rather than committees. The team assembled had true class. Aldo Mantovani was in charge of engineering, assisted by Carlo Chitti, Carlo Bosalia was responsible for engine development and Federico Hoffman devised the suspension. Aside from devising one of the greatest handling cars of the 1970s, Ruska's team's most impressive achievement with the Alpha Sud project was to keep it within budget and deliver it on time. He and his talented team created Alpha Sud, a clean sheet car, and got it onto the market within four short years. The industry average back then was near a six. The Sud 
might well have enjoyed a controversial gestation, but the end result was still a technical tour de force. From his bureau in Milan, Ruska pieced together a fascinating technical package and clothed it in a smart Giorgetto Giugiaro suit. The main goals for the project were that the new small car should be cheap and easily maintained, but retain the typical fun-to-drive Alpha character. To achieve this, everything the company had done before was thrown out of the window. Given Hruska's Volkswagen and Porsche background, it's unsurprising that he decided to choose a flat-four engine to power the Alfa Romeo Alfa Sud. This engine configuration, combined with water cooling and front-wheel drive, resulted in a low scuttle for good visibility, a low center of gravity, and near Isagonis levels of interior space efficiency. The short-stroke free revving engine was longitudinally mounted and was treated to a pair of equal-length drive shafts. Engine capacity was 1186 cc, maximum power was 63 HP, and it was developed for ease of maintenance as much as anything else. Although the curb weight had been well controlled, the aerodynamic body was structurally rigid thanks to deep box sections front and rear. The suspension was conventional independent McPherson, struts at the front, but clever, innovative beam axle with Watts linkage at the rear. And it was this rear setup that led to beautifully neutral handling. Final performance figures were impressive. The top speed of this 1.2-litre car was 90 Pumidor 4, well ahead of similarly sized opposition. The design was competed by the end of 1967, and by November 1968, prototype engine and body were married for the first time, and Hruska took his first test drive. This was a quick development program. Less than three years later, the Alpha Sud became the sensation of the 1971 Turin Car Expo, a great achievement considering the Lamborghini Countach prototype was also unveiled at the show. However, due to the last phase of Pomigliano d'Arco's development into a production facility, as well as a series of strikes and setbacks, production didn't actually get started until April 1972. As soon as the testers got their hands on the Alpha Sud, they knew the company had struck gold with its first small car. Auto Car magazine was unstinting in its praise, concluding in its first road test. The Sud, with front drive, flat four engine, and roomy four door body, offers truly incredible handling, a comfortable and quiet ride, and easy cruising. Working in combination with the high revving, exceptionally smooth and quiet engine, the crisp gearbox, and light but effective brakes, it is a dynamic masterstroke. It continued that the car offers remarkable economy and reasonable running costs shows how comprehensively engineered the Alfa Romeo Alfa Sud is and just how practical an inspirational driver's car like the Sud can be when executed properly. Once customers got hold of their cars, the horrible truth soon emerged. The low quality steel used in its production and scant rust proofing meant the gifted little car had become infamous for tinworm. Owners were finding their new cars would develop widespread corrosion, which could strike anywhere within a matter of months. In the end, the problem became so well known within the trade that it irrevocably damaged Alfa Romeo's reputation for a generation to come. Engineers divisited a quick fix, an extra step in production saw, all box sections filled with special synthetic foam, which it hoped would keep the rust at bay. Instead, moisture was trapped in it, and the corrosion process was accelerated. However, thanks to lamentable industrial relations and an indifferently skilled workforce, the Sud's troubles were far from over. Just like BL, Alfa Romeo suffered horribly from strikes during the 1970s, and during its life, the Sud's production line suffered from 700 stoppages. Despite being known as one of the rustiest cars ever made, the Alfa Sud remained a perennial favorite with motoring journalists and enthusiastic drivers. Throughout its life, 
the sud was praised to the hilt for its flat roll-free cornering, tactile steering, and rasping exhaust note. And that meant all manner of failings could be forgiven. Rivals emerged, and the Alpha Sud saw them all off. Austin's brave new Allegro of 1973 should have given the Sud a run for its money dynamically, but poor final development and shoddy body engineering meant the final product came a poor second. Even 1974's much-vaunted Volkswagen Golf couldn't match the Sud on a twisting road, even if it did highlight two major shortcomings, its lack of a hatchback and compromised driving position. The Sporting T for Turismo Internazionale version was launched in 1973, predating the Golf GTI by three years, and added a little spice to the range. Performance was boosted by, by the addition of a Weber twin-choke downdraft carburetor, upping the power of the 1186cc flat 4 to 68 HP. It was just the beginning. Then, the Giardinetta estate car version the following year. But even these was eclipsed by 1976 edition, the gorgeous Alpha Sud Sprint. It was this model that heralded the arrival of the uprated 75 HP 1286cc engine, finally pushing the top speed of the baby Alpha to over a 100 mile Like the saloon, the three-door coupe was styled by Giorgetto Giugiaro, and its scaled-down GTV style was handsome enough to win plenty of admirers, even if it wasn't the most practical proposition in the world, thanks to its fixed rear seat backrests. Now let's listen to the voice of Alfa Romeo Sprint. <laughs> Listen to this sound for hours. It is very nice. Let's not digress. Let's get back to our topic. In 1978, the wishes of keen drivers who begged for more power were partially met with the arrival of an upgunned 1.5-liter engine with up to 85 bbhp. While they were at it, the 1286cc engine was upgraded once again to 1351cc, but these changes signaled the Sud's gradual move upmarket. The 1.5-litre four-door was now available in super form, while the T benefited from its first facelift to become the Series 2. By the turn of 1980, the Sud was still seen as the dynamic class leader. Car Magazine declared it the car of the decade, and Ford used it as a benchmark for its front-wheel drive Escort MKIEI. Imagine how things would have been had it not been rusty. A facelift in the same year tidied things up, and the Sud became the Series 3. Dropping the chrome bumpers spoiled the clean-cut styling for many purists, but it kept the Sud looking fresh and highlighted the brilliance of Giugiaro's original design. The following year, the Sud gained a hatchback rear end, 1981 for the three-door, 82 for the five-door, answering the car's main non-rust-related criticism. The car put on an additional 25 kilos due to extra body stiffening, which slightly dented the performance. In 1983, the Alfa Romeo Alfa Sud was replaced by the new and rather wedgy 33. It looked good and retained much of the Sud's technical feature, and yet it failed to capture the hearts and minds of buyers. The new car's high price was also a problem, and that meant those fans of the entry-level Sud were left with no choice in the Alpha Sud range. That situation was rectified when the Arno was launched, the bastard offspring of the ill-fated Alfa Romeo Nissan tie-up. But even fewer people found themselves turned on by the idea of buying a Japanese-styled car built in Italy. The Sud Sprint lived on until 1989 thanks to its commonality with the 33, but even that glorious-looking car struggled as the decade progressed. Somehow, 80s styling details and a delicate-looking 70s wedge just don't mix. 
Despite being an engineering marvel and a delightful driver's car, the Alpha Sud was an undoubted failure for its maker. It made a loss from day one, and its poor reputation tarnished the Alfa Romeo name so badly the company ended up being bailed out by the Italian government. In reality, the Sud's excellence benefited the opposition more than its maker, as rivals worked hard on their own alternatives. Dear friends, that's it for today. Thank you for watching the video until the end. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video. Write your thoughts in the comments. Farewell, Fao Now.